Last time on Journey to the West, the virtuous monk Tripitaka found himself added to the menu of an evil cave demon, whose powerful wind laid even the mighty Sun Wukong low. With the help of the Bodhisattva Ling Chi, Sun Wukong and Tripitaka's new disciple Pigsy found a way to defeat the cave demon and save their master, only to encounter a new threat in the form of a cunning and powerful river spirit that barred their way. Unable to fight him underwater, Sun Wukong again had to rely on the skills of Pigsy to lure the demon out, but when even that failed, he called upon the merciful Quan Yin to intercede on their behalf. The river spirit turned into an unlikely ally when it was revealed that Quan Yin had previously enlisted him as Tripitaka's third disciple. Now with all our allies assembled, we are finally ready to embark on the journey to the west. So our heroes are trekking westward through a particularly uninhabited stretch of mountain when Tripitaka's tummy starts getting the rumblies and he tells Monkey to go find him some vegetarian food. So Monkey flies off to get him some fruit or something, in the process disturbing a local mountain demon, the White Bone Spirit, who pops out to see what's up. She sees Tripitaka and immediately realizes he's the monk all the demons are talking about, and that, because he's the reincarnation of Golden Cicada and has pursued a perfect monk lifestyle, if she eats him, she'll become immortal. So she's about to swoop down and grab him then and there, but she recognizes Sandy and Pigsy as two former celestial warriors and backs off, resolving to be sneakier about this. So she disguises herself as a beautiful young woman and minces over to Tripitaka with some delicious poisoned rice for him. So Pigsy immediately gets his flirt on while the white bone spirit spins a sob story about having to care for her aging parents that she totally has. So while she's trying to convince Tripitaka to eat her delicious not at all poisoned rice, Monkey flies back with an armload of peaches and immediately sees that this girl is a demon with his special demon eyes. So so he drops everything and whips out his murder stick, but Tripitaka panics and grabs him because seriously, dude, at least explain your motivation. So Monkey's like, all right, dude, listen, disguising yourself as a hot chick, that's like man-eating demon trick number one. Hell, I did it all the time back when I ate people. Amazingly, this stirring argument fails to convince Tripitaka, so Monkey's like, all right, I get it. You think she's hot. How about I give you two lovebirds a little privacy? And while Tripitaka's paralyzed with embarrassment, Monkey smacks the demon in the face. So Tripitaka's like, Monkey, what the hell? But Monkey points out that the delicious, totally not poisoned rice had rotted and filled with maggots as soon as he killed her, which is not typically a trait of healthy food. So Tripitaka almost believes him until Pigsy, extremely salty about Monkey ruining his chances to score, goes all, oh sure, come on, what's more likely? That Monkey just killed a demon or that Monkey just murdered an innocent girl and used his powers to make you think he killed a demon? So Tripitaka gets really mad and uses the magic migraine spell, then tells Monkey that a killer can't be one of his disciples. But Monkey manages to persuade him to let him stay and the group awkwardly treks on after burying the totally innocent girl. Speaking of, the white bone spirit had actually dropped her body right at the moment of impact and skedaddled off into the sky, leaving her body below. She starts working on how to get rid of monkeys so she can get some of that sweet man flesh. So she turns into an elderly woman and hobbles up to the group like, excuse me, have any of you seen my beautiful innocent daughter that totally came this way a little while ago? I'd hate to think that something happened to her. So Monkey obviously insta-kills her, again, and Tripitaka flips out, uses the migraine spell, and with Pigsy's encouragement, kicks him out of the group again. But Monkey's like, all right, but if you're gonna kick me out, could you at least get this stupid thing off first? Which is when everyone learns that Tripitaka has no idea how to get Monkey's cursed hat off his head. So he agrees to keep Monkey on as a disciple, since it wouldn't be fair to cut him loose without actually actually cutting him loose, and they continue on together. Soon enough, they spot a totally innocent old man in the distance, and Pigsy's like, oh, horror of horrors! Clearly, this is the patriarch of the family that Sun Wukong so callously murdered for no reason. Clearly, Monkey will use his great powers to escape justice and leave us to take the blame. Oh, horror of horrors! Clearly Sun Wukong has bewitched this innocent old man's corpse to look like the body of a demon! In case you haven't noticed, Tripitaka is supremely gullible in this chapter, so sure enough it's migraine time and getting kicked out of the group o'clock. This time Monkey's like, alright, you know what, fine! And after Tripitaka writes an official letter of banishment and Monkey is aggressively polite in taking his leave, Monkey warns Sandy not to bind to Pigsy's BS and then blasts off. Nice one, Tripitaka. So Monkey returns to his home on Flower Fruit Mountain, only to find it in ruins. Turns out after Monkey got sealed away, Erlang burned the whole place down for funsies. The remaining monkeys are being hunted every Every day by a huge band of hunters. So Monkey decides the time has come for some much needed stress relief and brings down the wrath of Wu Kong on the hunters the next time they appear. So while Monkey's having the time of his life as King of the Mountain again, the story shifts back to Tripitaka and friends. But let's take a minute to step out of the story and examine it on a meta level because what just happened was fascinating. This text is centuries old, but the way Monkey's acting could be lifted directly and put in something modern and it'd make perfect sense. After getting kicked out and losing his purpose, Monkey is visibly emotionally unstable, oscillating between heartbreaking homesickness to cathartic rage to overzealous partying and back again. Like, there's no need to dig deep here. His emotional responses are there for all the world to see. And the reason for that is because we can't forget that the journey to the West is an allegory and Monkey represents the mind. Monkey just gave up on everything he was trying to do, which was to get Tripitaka to the Thunderclap Monastery. He's basically going through an existential crisis and the book is representing that perfectly because it's kind of the point of the book. It's like an allegorical roadmap. This is a part of the journey where you'll probably be feeling these things and facing these temptations. The characters feel real and genuine in their reactions to things because they all represent vital components of the human mind and the way they act is the way we act. It's not like Bay 
Beowulf, where he's a great and noble king with very little else to define him. These characters are meant to feel real, to be something we can see ourselves in. This book is really good. Anyway, Stripataka and friends enter a super ominous pine forest, whereupon things immediately go wrong. First, Pigsy fails to find Tripataka any food and opts to take a nap instead. Then, while Sandy goes to look for him, Tripataka enters a pagoda to light incense and pray, and manages to wake up a sleeping demon in the process and get insta-captured. So Sandy manages to find Pigsy and drags him back to the camp, whereupon they find Tripataka missing and reason that he probably went to check out that beautiful pagoda in the distance. It's only when they get closer that Sandy realizes it's actually a demon cave, at which point Pigsy decides that picking a fight with the demon sounds like a great idea. So they fight and it's pretty cool, but even with the backup of the various gods that have been assisting Tripataka on his path, Sandy and Pigsy can only fight the demon to a standstill. But while that's going on, Tripataka meets with a stroke of luck. Turns out the demon's wife is a kidnapped princess named Hundred Flowers Shame, who's willing to help him in exchange for him delivering news of her whereabouts to her family in the West. So she frees Tripataka, gives him a letter, and convinces her husband to stop beating up his friends. Tripataka and friends hurry out the back door and continue westward, soon coming across the very kingdom Hundred Flowers Shame was stolen from. Tripataka delivers the letter to the king, who's profoundly grateful to finally know what happened to his daughter, but sadly says that they're unequipped to stage a rescue if it involves fighting a demon. But surely Tripataka must be able to, if he's managed to make it this far already. So Tripataka reluctantly summons his disciples, whereupon the king asks which of them is better at slaying demons. Pigsy gets his brag on and starts showing off his powers, which soundly convinces the king that he's perfectly equipped to go off and fight the same demon he was having worlds of trouble with last time. So Pigsy zips off for the rematch of the century, with Sandy tagging along to make sure he doesn't hurt himself. So Pigsy breaks down the door and proceeds to get his ass soundly kicked, so he excuses himself and runs away, leaving Sandy to try and fight the demon himself. This goes predictably poorly, and Sandy gets captured while Pigsy hides in a thorn bush. So the demon reasons that the disciples must have come back because the princess snuck a letter out with them and confronts her about it. Obviously, she denies it, and when he interrogates Sandy about it, he catches on and denies it too. So the demon immediately switches off the murderous intent and gets all buddy buddy with his wife again. He then decides to pay a visit to his father in law, shape shifting himself into something a little more presentable. So the demon heads over to the king's court and spins a sob story about some shape shifting tiger demon he saw threatening the princess way back when, so he drove it off and saved her life and then married her because she never told him she was a princess, and hey, look, that guy over there is totally the demon I was talking about. So the demon spins an illusion around Tripitaka, making him look like a tiger monster, which is all the evidence the king needs to have Tripitaka locked up. So things look pretty terrible, right? I mean, Sandy's been captured, Pigsy's off hiding somewhere, Tripitaka's been locked up, and Monkey's back on Flower Fruit Mountain without a care in the world. Who could possibly rescue Tripitaka now? <laughs> That's right! It's finally the horse dragon's time to shine! So the dragon turns back to his true form and scouts out the palace a little, and sees that the demon has returned to his true form and is currently in the process of eating his attendants and drinking all the wine in the palace. So the dragon shapeshifts into a beautiful young woman and scoots into the hall, impressing the demon with magic tricks and singing for him. Soon enough, the demon asks if she can dance, and the dragon's like, oh, a little, but it'll look much better if I use swords. So she does a little sword dance for him until she spots her opening and takes a swing. The dragon turns back to his true form and does battle with the demon for a while, but he's clearly outclassed and ends up having to run after his leg gets injured. He hides at the bottom of the moat until the demon loses interest and then turns back into a horse and limps into the stable for the night. Soon, however, Pigsy comes crawling back, hoping to get some help in rescuing Sandy. Instead, he gets chewed out by the horse for being too overconfident and ruining everything. Pigsy decides the sane course of action would be to pack his things and return to his peaceful life in the village with his own kidnapped wife, but the horse is having precisely none of his sass today and refuses to let him leave, unless it's to go apologize to Monkey and get him to sort this all out. So Pigsy reluctantly flies off to Flowerfruit Mountain, whereupon he finds Sun Wukong hanging out with his enormous monkey army. Pigsy tries to sneak closer, but Monkey's spots the intruder and has his monkeys bring him up to the front. He immediately recognizes Pigsy, and after being assured that he hasn't been banished too, Pigsy, rather than owning up to the disaster scenario, instead tells Monkey that nothing's wrong, Tripitaka just missed him so much. So Monkey's like, neat, in that case, let's just hang out for a little while. So Monkey leisurely spends his morning hanging out on his beautiful mountain and eating fruit, while Pigsy tries to find ways to persuade Monkey to leave right this second without seeming too desperate. After a while, Pigsy's like, well, <laughs> we've sure kept our master waiting, we should probably go. Monkey's like, oh yeah, great, see ya. Pigsy's like, wait, you're not coming? And Monkey's like, ha, no, I got banished, remember? Besides, I got a good thing going here. Tell Tripitaka not to bother me again. So Pigsy leaves, but he's only a few miles down the mountain before he starts ranting and insulting Monkey. So Wukong has his monkeys recapture Pigsy and bring him back to explain his poor manners. So the truth comes out as Pigsy explains how everything went wrong, although he does embellish a little to motivate Monkey to come help him. So Monkey flies to the demon's lair and immediately abducts two of the demon's children, offering to release them in exchange for Sandy. The princess runs back inside and frees him, and Monkey, after reuniting with Sandy, sends them off to the palace with the two kids in tow to lure out the demon and bring him back to his lair. Meanwhile, Monkey shapeshifts into the princess and waits in the cave for the demon to return. So Sandy and Pigsy drop the kids in front of the palace, killing them, but it's okay because they were evil or something. And the demon, a little too hungover to want to fight, decides to check his lair first to see if they really were his kids and if he needs to avenge them. So the demon returns to his cave, whereupon he finds totally the real princess crying her eyes out about her two dead kids. The demon's like, Ooh, I'm gonna get him right after I make sure you're okay, darling. Princess Monkey is like, oh man, I'm just so distraught. So the demon's like, don't worry, honey, I've got an elixir for exactly that. Whereupon Monkey takes it, swallows it whole, and reverts to his true form in preparation for some cathartic ass kicking. So they have an epic battle and it's really cool, but when Monkey fakes 
an error and uses the opportunity to get in a solid hit, the demon straight up vanishes. Monkey scans all four directions but can't find him, puts two and two together, and realizes that the demon must have been a heavenly spirit, which explains why he couldn't find him anywhere on Earth. So he busts his way into heaven again, what is this, like the fourth time, and demands to know what spirits were unaccounted for. Turns out the demon was really Ravati, the wood wolf star, known to us modern people as Zeta Pisceum. See, turns out the princess was actually another heavenly courtier, in this case an incense tender, who desperately wanted to elope with him. He was afraid that such an act would be unthinkable in heaven, so the two of them departed to Earth to carry on their love in secret. And yeah, if you think too hard about it, it kind of makes the entire story fall apart, but we don't have to worry about it anymore because the demon is in custody and all that's left to do is to pick up Tripitaka. So the princess explains everything to her father, the king, and they head down to get Tripitaka, who's still locked up in the illusion of a tiger. After Monkey gets his sass on for a little bit, he frees Tripitaka from the spell and everyone is friends again. Will Pigsy stop being dragged around by his own base desires? Will Sandy ever win a fight? Will Tripitaka learn to trust Monkey's judgment? Will Monkey learn the benefits of communication? And will the horse ever do anything plot relevant again? Find out next time on Journey to the West.